Don't you wish you invested in Apple, Microsoft, Nvidia, Tesla or even Bitcoin years or decades back when they were trading at insanely low valuations? Well, quantum computers could be the next technology that will cause these stocks of companies involved in their development to skyrocket. Its market size alone is projected to rise from around $458 million in 2021 to $5 billion by 2030. That's a 10x increase in less than 10 years. Not only are we going to explain what quantum computers are, but also what what will they do and how can you invest in them? And we're going to go through all of that in less than 10 minutes. First of all, quantum computers aren't supercomputers. There's something different entirely. And to understand them, you basically need to understand three things. Superposition, entanglement and interference. But let's quickly go over classical computers so we can better understand the difference. Everything you type into your computer, all words, numbers, colors, get translated into bits, which can be either a zero or a one. Meanwhile, quantum computers use quantum bits or qubits, which are physically single photons, electrons or atoms and can also be set to one of two values. But it doesn't have to be just a 1 or a 0. It can be in both states at once. This is called a superposition. As long as it's unobserved, the qubit is in a superposition of probabilities for 0 and 1. And you can't predict which one it will be. But the instant you measure it, it collapses into one of the definite states. This simultaneous state of both 0 and 1 makes it possible to store and manipulate vast amounts of information with a relatively small amount of particles. Qubits form a close connection called entanglement that makes each of the qubits react to a change in the other state instantaneously, no matter how far they are apart. This means when measuring just one entangled qubit, you can directly find out properties of its partners without having to look. I think it's easier to understand if you think of qubits as wave functions. And when multiple qubits are entangled, their wave functions add up. Just like waves in a water, they can constructively interfere and touch together to make a bigger wave or destructive interfere to cancel each other out. The overall wave function of all entangled qubits sets the probability of different states or answers. With quantum algorithms, we then use constructive interference to increase the probability of the correct answer and destructive interference to decrease the probabilities of the incorrect answers, so that when you measure it, the correct answer will come out. The main problem with quantum computers is that it's hard to control quantum systems because if you've got any slight interaction with the outside world, the information starts leaking away. So you have to shield them from any kind of noise, like heat energy, cosmic rays and radiation. IBM for example keeps their quantum computer at around 15 millikelvin, which is colder than outer space. Unfortunately though, it's impossible to remove noise completely from a physical system and it gets worse the more qubits you have entangled with each other. So the main difference between classical and quantum computers is in which algorithms they can run. Which means that quantum computers aren't necessarily better than normal computers, they just allow us to solve problems that classical computers just can't. Like finding structure in tons of data when you can use the fact that you have all these quantum superpositions available to you at the same time to do some kind of parallel computation. Quantum computers are essentially good at things that have a small input and output, while having a vast array of possibilities. One of the most well-known uses is cracking current encryption of bank accounts. I'm not going to go into detail because there are lots of videos about it on YouTube, but all you need to know is that the current encryption, the RSA encryption works because factorization, or in other words finding out factors of large numbers, is extremely slow on classical computers. The main reason being that only two factors are the correct ones out of millions of possible combinations. And there is no efficient classical algorithm for finding these factors. But there is a fast quantum algorithm that can efficiently find factors of large numbers. We could also use quantum computers to simulate nature. Because nature is fundamentally quantum and it obeys quantum physics, it can be modeled on a classical computer without making bad approximations. They are so inaccurate because the electrons in the real world are themselves in superposition. For example, modeling the strong of a molecule of an everyday drug such as penicillin, which has 41 atoms at ground state, requires a classical computer with more bits than there are atoms in the observable universe. But for quantum computers, this type of simulation requires a processor with just 286 qubits. Another potential use is simulation of material properties, like understanding what makes some materials superconduct, or study important chemical reactions to improve their efficiency. We would basically be able to prototype many different materials 
materials inside a quantum computer and test all their physical parameters, instead of having to physically make them and test them in a lab, which is a much more expensive process. We could also optimize machine learning and AI, financial modeling and weather forecasting. But I have to point out that a lot of the claims of what quantum computers will be good for come from people who are actively raising money to build them. So these claims might not be entirely true. For example, I found one interview of a physicist who said that quantum computing could be used as a way to explore physics. Now, whether that's going to uh, make anybody any money, uh, whether there will be practical applications in the near term, that's still very much an open question. But when a new technology has come along, the people of the time aren't the best at being able to tell what it's going to be used for. For example, the people who invented the first computers never even imagined the internet and all of the things on it. And this is likely to be the same for quantum computers. Like with most technologies, when the first breakthrough happens, we'll enter a hype cycle where the media and everyone picks it up, thinking that quantum computers are around the corner, but they're just not ready yet, and expectation will probably follow before the real breakthrough happens in a couple of decades. On a quantum computing roadmap of 5 steps, before we get a full-scale error-corrected quantum computer, people are currently working on the first and the second task, which is why I think that first major breakthrough is yet to come. Because this technology is new and is still evolving, we have a lot of different models of quantum computers, such as the gate model which is the most popular and the most understood, the measurement model, the adiabatic quantum computing and quantum annealing, and lastly topological quantum computing. We also have different approaches of quantum computers, such as the superconducting quantum computers which are the most popular, quantum dot computers, linear optical quantum computers, trapped ion quantum computers, color center quantum computers and neutral atoms in optical lattices. Obviously you would want to invest in the company that makes the best one. But how can you tell which one is the best if there are so many different quantum computers? What you mostly see in the media is the number of qubits. But there are lots of factors that play into the performance of a quantum computer. Like error rates, crosstalk between qubits, connectivity, systematic errors and efficiency of a compiler. My point being that you can't just look at the number of of qubits and say which one is the best. There are some proposed metrics by IBM which would allow us to compare quantum computers based on all factors, but unfortunately just a few companies published their results using these metrics. So I think the best way to invest in them is to buy at least one stock of a company for each variation of a quantum computer. But while searching through all different companies making quantum computers, I came to a problem. Most of them are not publicly traded and I couldn't find a stock for for each type of quantum computers, although I managed to find 9 stocks. So firstly we have companies that are working on superconducting quantum computers such as Google, IBM and Trigetti. D-Wave is working on a quantum annealer, IonQ and Honeywell are making trapped ion quantum computers. Meanwhile Intel is going for a totally different approach by building a quantum processor and making its qubits from individual electrons. Microsoft is trying to make a topological quantum computer and lastly quantum computing is using the measurement model to make its entropy quantum computer. There are also companies that are making simulations of quantum computers on classical computers such as Atos SE, and companies that are making systems that combine classical computing with quantum computing just like Nvidia. So we could add these two stocks to the pie, but I think that those 9 stocks are the most important ones, because they are actually working on quantum computers, and with 5 out of 9 stocks being large cap stocks, Stocks, I think this buy is relatively safe, because these companies are not only making quantum computers, but are also generating revenue from other products. As for the other 4 stocks, I don't think that I have to point out that they are far from being profitable, and are quite risky with 3 of them even being micro caps. But with just 9 stocks we covered 4 out of 5 quantum computer models and 2 out of 6 approaches of quantum computers. But before you decide to do anything, do your own due diligence, and if you if you know any quantum computing stocks that I missed, please let me know down in the comments. And if you would like to support my channel, consider subscribing and thanks for watching.